What's up guys, I'm Rosh and I'm back with another episode of Skeptics Say the Dumbest Things. Today we're looking at a video by Praga University, which, despite its academic sounding name, is actually a conservative YouTube channel dedicated to putting out videos on various political talking points, from gun rights and Islam to race relations and national debt. But, this being a climate change channel, today we're looking at a video of theirs entitled Climate Change. What do the scientists say? Which is an excellent question. So, without further ado, let's have a look and find out. I'm an atmospheric physicist. I've published more than 200 scientific papers. For 30 years, I taught at MIT, during which time the climate has changed remarkably little. But the cry of global warming has grown ever more shrill. In 30 years? I mean, in that albeit very short time frame, global average temperatures have risen by 0.4 degrees Celsius. Not to mention the fact that atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have risen by about 70 parts per million. Both of those are very rapid, and the latter is completely unprecedented in the geological record. But we'll ignore that. I'm probably starting to sound a bit shrill. In fact, it seems that the less the climate changes, the louder the voices of the climate alarmists get. Whoa, whoa, rewind. Do you notice anything interesting about that graph? Isn't it interesting that Ritchie here has decided to pick 1997 to start his temperature data? Now we know he's a scientist. I'm an atmospheric physicist. So we know that he understands that the scientific definition of climate is the long-term average of weather, normally taken as a minimum of 30 years. So why is he only showing us 19 years? Hell, he also just said that over the last 30 years, the climate has changed remarkably little. So surely he'd show us data for at least that time period. Also, according to practically every global data set, 2016 was the hottest year on record, which directly contradicts the graph Richard is showing us. So where exactly is he getting his data from? It seems he forgot to provide a source, but fortunately he's got me here to fact check for him, and I tracked it down. It appears to be from the RSS satellite data set, which calculates tropospheric temperature by measuring outgoing radiation via satellite. Interestingly, this data set is one of the only data sets which doesn't show warming for the period Rich is showing us, though it does for the period prior to 1997. If we look at data from direct temperature measurements at the surface, rather than RSS satellite data, we see an altogether different picture. But why is there a discrepancy between direct surface measurements and those taken by the RSS satellites? Well, there was an error in the calculations they used to convert the outgoing radiation into temperature data. It failed to account for the fact that over time, the orbit of a satellite decays, i.e. it shifts ever so slightly. When scientists corrected for this in 2017, the data actually showed marginally more warming than other data sets. So let's correct Rich's graph for him. That's much better. In fact, it seems that the less the climate changes, the louder the voices of the climate alarmists get. Strange. Now we've got an accurate data set. It doesn't seem to support what Rich is saying. It's almost like Rich has cherry-picked the one data set which supports his statement, while ignoring the fact that practically every other data set shows the opposite. But Rich is an atmospheric physicist. He'd never do that, surely. So let's clear the air and create a more accurate picture of where we really stand on the issue of global warming, or as it is now called, climate change. They're two different but related phenomena, Rich. But you're a scientist. You already know that. There are basically three groups of people dealing with this issue. Groups one and two are scientists. Group three consists mostly, at its core, of politicians, environmentalists, and media. And let's not forget fossil fuel interests. Group one is associated with the scientific part of the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC Working Group One. These are scientists who mostly believe that recent climate change is primarily due to man's burning of fossil fuels, and they believe this might eventually dangerously heat the planet. Yeah, so Working Group One, as far as I understand it, is a group of scientists appointed by the IPCC to review the existing literature on climate change and synthesize it into one of their reports. The vast majority of climate scientists, however, have nothing to do with Working Group One, so I really hope Rich isn't trying to imply that the only scientists who believe in anthropogenic global warming are those employed by the IPCC. That would be extremely dishonest. Group Two is made up of scientists who don't see this as an especially serious problem. Oh, he is. 
Richard, this is disingenuous and you know it. First of all, stop pretending there's any kind of debate within the scientific community about whether or not man is to blame for recent climate change. The overwhelming majority of studies into climate change have concluded that anthropogenic emissions are the primary factor in recent warming. Secondly, implying that those who believe anthropogenic global warming is happening are only doing so because they are employed by the IPCC is frankly slanderous. The vast majority of climate scientists will never see a grant from the IPCC, let alone employment by them. This is the group I belong to. We're usually referred to as skeptics. We note that there are many reasons why the climate changes, the sun, clouds, oceans, the orbital variations of the Earth, as well as a myriad of other inputs. Yeah, no one disputes this. And you're implying that the first group of scientists, you know, the 97%, don't believe this. That's so obviously untrue, it actually sickens me to hear you say it. None of these is fully understood, and there is no evidence that CO2 emissions are the dominant factor. Yes, none of the factors that govern the climate are fully understood. But guess what? Nothing in science is fully understood. That's why we do science. If anything was fully understood, we'd stop studying it. And just because something isn't fully understood doesn't mean it's not well understood. But of course, that's what you're trying to imply. And saying that CO2 isn't the dominant factor is pretty meaningless since there are so many factors which govern the climate that there is no such thing as a dominant factor. That being said, any one of those factors can be dominant at a given time, and all the evidence shows that CO2 is the dominant factor in recent warming. But actually, there is much agreement between both groups of scientists. The following are such points of agreement. One, the climate is always changing. Yep, I'm glad you acknowledged this. So many skeptics seem to think it's news to climate scientists that the climate has always changed. Two. CO2 is a greenhouse gas without which life on Earth is not possible, but adding it to the atmosphere should lead to some warming. Great, perhaps you could tell some of your skeptic friends this. It never ceases to amaze me how many skeptics deny the basic physics of the greenhouse effect. Three, atmospheric levels of CO2 have been increasing since the end of the Little Ice Age. Or to be more accurate, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You know, the process which actually created that CO2. The Little Ice Age was a regional phenomena, largely contained within the Northern Hemisphere, so I'm not entirely sure why Rich is trying to tie the two together here. Four, over this period, past two centuries, the global mean temperature has increased slightly and erratically by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius. But only since the 1960s have man's greenhouse emissions been sufficient to play a role. Yeah, the first part is true, but the exact date when human impacts on the climate became noticeable is debatable, with some studies putting it as early as the mid-19th century, and some putting it more around 1950-1960, as Rich says. Nonetheless, if we look at cumulative emissions, we can see that 90% of them have occurred since 1950, so it's not particularly surprising that human impacts have only recently been felt. 5. Given the complexity of climate, no confident prediction about future global mean temperature or its impact can be made. The IPCC acknowledged in its own 2007 report that, quote, the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible, end quote. End quote? But Richard, the quote's not quite over, is it? Perhaps you forgot to say the qualifying sentence which came next. Now, you're a scientist. I know you know the context of that quote, but not all of your viewers will. Here, I'll help you. The climate system is a coupled non-linear chaotic system, and therefore the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. Rather, the focus must be upon the prediction of the probability distribution of the system's future possible states by the generation of ensembles of model solutions. Yeah, that's a mouthful. I can see why you'd rather not say that. But it is important because the IPCC is saying that while we can't predict the exact, precise climate of the future, we can produce a range of probabilities of possible future climates, depending on various variables. Yes, there are uncertainties, but we understand broadly how the climate works. And the largest uncertainties are actually more to do with human behaviour than they are to do with the natural climate. For example, we don't know how much more carbon we're going to emit into the atmosphere. And that's why the IPCC produces a range of different emission scenarios. So no, we don't know the exact climate of the future. But we do know that if we continue to pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the climate will continue to warm, and we can quantify that. So why are so many people worried, indeed panic-stricken, about this issue? Here's where Group 3 comes in. 
the politicians, environmentalists, and media. Global warming alarmism provides them, more than any other issue, with the things they most want. For politicians, it's money and power. For environmentalists, it's money for their organizations and confirmation of their near-religious devotion to the idea that man is a destructive force acting upon nature. And for the media, it's ideology, money, and headlines. And let's not forget fossil fuel interests, Richard. You're quite right that money and ideology make a potent mix. Collectively, oil and gas firms are worth over 4 trillion US dollars. But I suppose they'd never use that money to interfere with science. Only those pesky environmentalists would do that. Meanwhile, over the last decade, scientists outside of climate physics have jumped on the bandwagon, publishing papers blaming global warming for everything from acne to the Syrian civil war. Yeah, and get this. There was even a study which said the atmosphere was like a human eye. Ridiculous, right? Except that study was by Richard. Now, I'm not going to comment on the merits of that paper but I would like to take this opportunity to demonstrate how easy it is to make scientific papers sound stupid if you give no context. And crony capitalists have eagerly grabbed for the subsidies that governments have so lavishly provided. Why are skeptics so keen to accuse their opponents of corruption and financial investment in their beliefs? Estimates vary for global fossil fuel subsidies, depending on how you define a subsidy. The total value ranges from hundreds of billions a year to over five trillion. At the lower end of that estimate, fossil fuel subsidies still are double that of renewables, and at the upper end it completely dwarfs renewable subsidies altogether. Personally, I prefer to stick to talking about the science, rather than getting involved in the mudslinging of politics. But it seems to me a rather self-defeating point to accuse environmentalists of being motivated by money when their opposition is so much wealthier. And why is this atmospheric physicist so hung up on talking about the politics? Surely a physicist of his calibre could blast us with scientific facts to prove his point. But instead he's focusing on questioning the motives of his opposition. It's not a very scientific approach. It's almost as if the science doesn't support his points. Unfortunately, Group 3 is winning the argument because they have drowned out the serious debate that should be going on. But while politicians, environmentalists, and media types can waste a lot of money and scare a lot of people, they won't be able to bury the truth. The climate will have the final word on that. I could not have put it better myself. I'm Richard Linson, Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at MIT for Prager University. Well, I'm disappointed, but I can't say I'm surprised. Bar the reference of that one rather dodgy graph, Richard didn't even attempt to engage with the science here. I do have to admit it was clever. A well-executed and evasive attack on his fellow climate scientists, which aimed to undermine their authority of expertise without actually engaging with any of their arguments, all the while ironically relying on his own authority as an expert. Anyway, that's all for today. Thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed my content, please like and subscribe, I hugely appreciate it. As always, the link to the original video and all my sources are in the description. Unlike some people, I'm not afraid to be fact-checked. Stay scientific people, and until next time, goodbye.